Council at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro, and welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. It's often said that an effect is an event or state that's brought about as the result of another event that is the cause, the cause and effect. There are countless psychological and cultural effects that impact our actions and our lives, and very often we're not even consciously aware of them. There can also be physical effects that relate to things like sleep deprivation, where the cause is a lack of sleep, and the effect might be an inability to think clearly. If the cause is drinking too much, the effects can range from impaired judgment to a loss of consciousness. In this episode, we're going to explore some interesting effects or phenomena. You could be familiar with some of them, and as to the others, well, I hope you're intrigued by what we're about to learn. And so with that in mind, let's start with what can only be called a cultural phenomenon, the Taylor Swift effect, or how a pop star created her own economy. Whether you're a fan of Taylor Swift or not, it's hard to deny that she's become both a cultural and financial phenomenon. The Taylor Swift effect contemplates not only her musical success, but the impact she's had on the lives of her millions of fans. From the clothes they buy and wear to the food they eat, even now to the football games they watch. Her era's music tour filled stadiums across the U.S. during the past year and around the world, and it's reported to be the single highest grossing concert tour of all time, with just the concert ticket revenue alone exceeding a billion dollars. The overall economic impact from tour-related spending relating to that tour is said to total about $5 billion, and that exceeds the yearly economic output of about 50 different countries. On average, Taylor Swift's fans who attended her concerts over the past year spent about $1,300 each. That's about $400 on average for the tickets, more than $100 on food and drinks, $400 on travel and lodging, more than $150 on concert-related merchandise, and my favorite, about $250 each on new clothing and outfits just to attend the concert. It's estimated that the merchandise revenue alone amounted to about $200 million in 2023. And the normally staid Federal Reserve Bank even reported that, despite a slowing overall recovery in tourism in the Philadelphia area, for example, May 2023 was the, quote, strongest month for hotel revenue in Philadelphia since the onset of the pandemic. And I continue the quote, in large part due to an influx of guests for the Taylor Swift concerts in the city. So that's the economic side of the Taylor Swift effect. What about the social and cultural effects? Those are said to start with a remarkably strong social and emotional bond people feel with her recognizing that she began as a clean-cut 15-year-old girl with a guitar and stories of teenage life and angst. It said her fans develop a strong sense of connectivity and relatability, which is interesting because even though there are aspects of her life that can't possibly feel relatable to most of us, especially her fans, she is, after all, a billionaire celebrity living a high-profile life, dating a high-profile Super Bowl football player. And yet, it said the lyrical content and emotions that underlie her song and songs create a bond. And Swift is viewed by her fans as both aspirational and inspirational, a role model, if you were, seen as an example of a woman who stands firm to her values, and she encourages her fan base to do the same. By the way, speaking of her connection with football, just after the news initially broke that she and Kansas City Chiefs football player Travis Kelsey were dating, the impact of the Taylor Swift effect was immediate and dazzling. Millions more people tuned into television games. Sales of Kelsey's jerseys increased exponentially. And just the rumor of her attending one of his football games caused ticket prices to spike, sometimes double. 
It's been reported that in 2023 alone, the Taylor Swift effect generated an equivalent brand value of more than $300 million for the Kansas City Chiefs and for the National Football League. Effects from one singer to another. That brings us to something called the Streisand effect. It's a phenomenon in which attempts to hide, censor, or prevent access to something have the opposite result, the unintended consequence of drawing far more attention to that thing. So to understand it, try picturing this. Let's say I accidentally spill a drop of coffee on my clean white shirt. Option one is for me to just leave it alone. It's such a tiny drop of coffee, hardly anyone's going to notice it. My second option is to try and dab the spot with a damp paper towel. But life being what it is, the more I dab, the more the stain spreads. And what began as a tiny drop of coffee the size of a pinhead is now the size of a quarter and spreading fast. It's gone from being unnoticeable to how can you miss it? I should have just left it alone. And few, if anyone, would have seen it. Now, though, through my actions, I've drawn attention to that stain. And that, at its core, is my explanation of the Streisand effect. So here's the story that underlies the Streisand effect. In January 2003, as part of a study into the eroding California coastline, a photographer by the name of Kenneth Edelman took over 12,000 aerial photos of the coastline. It was part of something called the California Coastal Records Project. None of the photos identified any property or their owners. And of those 12,000 or so pictures taken from a helicopter, one photo was of Barbara Streisand's Malibu house and property. But again, like all the other photos of property, it was not identified. Still, I rate over the fact that an image of her house and property was now accessible online to anyone who wanted to view it. She filed a lawsuit seeking tens of millions of dollars, asserting that the inclusion of a single frame, a photograph that includes her bluff top Malibu estate, invaded her privacy, violated the anti-paparazzi statute in California, sought to profit from her name and threatened her security. The other defendant in the case besides the photographer was the project's internet service provider that published the photos online. The lawsuit, well, it was ultimately dismissed and Streisand was in fact required to pay the photographer's legal fees of almost $180,000. So like that tiny spot of coffee on a clean white shirt that was pretty much unnoticeable, before Streisand filed her lawsuit, it's widely reported that the image of her Malibu mansion had only been downloaded on the internet a handful of times, five or six, and that included twice by her own lawyers. After news of her lawsuit was made public though, well, like the coffee stain that spread, so did word of the lawsuit. It's said that after only one month after filing her lawsuit, that same internet site saw over 400,000 new visitors viewing that single image of her property. So just like that tiny drop of coffee on the white shirt, if left alone, only a handful of people, if any, might have seen the photo of Barbara Streisand's home. But by filing her lawsuit, she effectively, effectively publicized just what it was she wanted to keep private. And the Streisand effect was born. So, what do Curious George and Disney's animated movie Snow White have in common with the first president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, a well-known anti-apartheid activist? The actor is what comes to be known as the Ma Mandela Effect. The Mandela Effect. It's a phenomenon in which a group of people share a collective memory that happens to be false. It never happened as all of these people remember to have. What's fascinating is the fact that this occurs in people who aren't connected to one another, but they somehow remember the same inaccurate, yes, inaccurate details about an event or image in popular culture, movies, books, television. It's also known as collective false memory. 
In this case, it began in 2010, after a South African woman claimed there were many people who, like her, had mistakenly believed that Nelson Mandela had died in prison in the 1980s. Although he had spent decades of his life imprisoned for a host of politically related offenses, he didn't die there. And in reality, Mandela was very much alive at the time, in 2010, when a large group of people were seeking to honor his memory through various events. The fact of the matter is he didn't die until 2013 at the age of 95. So how is it that so many people misremembered the same thing? Well, misremembering has been said to be a result of distorted memories or misrepresentations or even inaccurate reporting of an event or person. It's also been attributed to what's known as confabulation, a neuropsychiatric disorder where someone has a false memory and yet they have no intent to deceive. They genuinely believe their memory is accurate, even when objectively it's been proved to be false. It's also been called honest lying. And we've all experienced it in one way or the other. You may vividly remember something from your childhood, but the truth is it didn't happen as you imagined. It's said that confabulation may be a kind of compensatory mechanism to fill the holes in our memory. And it's different than lying because those who confabulate genuinely believe the information they're remembering and maybe sharing with others, even if it's inaccurate, while those who lie deliberately seek to mislead or deceive. So, what are some other examples of the Mandela effect? In 1937, Walt Disney Productions released its first animated full-length feature film, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. Most of us have seen the movie at one time or another, and we can probably remember the famous line when the evil queen stands in front of a mirror and utters those iconic words, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? The truth is, she actually said, magic mirror on the wall, who is the fairest one of all? That's right, we've collectively misremembered the same thing. Most of us would say mirror, mirror, not magic mirror. Picture the classic board game Monopoly and Mr. Monopoly, who by the way was originally known as Rich Uncle Milbourne Pennybags. The fellow with a mustache and a monocle who wears a tuxedo, carries a top hat and cane. His image is often on the game's box cover as well as on the chance and community chess cards. The truth is, he doesn't have a monocle, that single round eyeglass that's held in place by facial muscles. He never did have one. Even though the majority of people surveyed consistently say they'd swear to it that he wears a monocle. By the way, if you're one of the many who thinks he does, well, look again. You may be confusing Mr. Monopoly with Planters Peanuts, Mr. Peanut. He wears a monocle. Here's one more for you. The Mandela Effect and Curious George. Most of us are familiar with Curious George, aptly described as a little monkey with an insatiable curiosity, and often pictured in what looks like a brown monkey suit akin to a pair of pajamas. And George is often set against a bright yellow background. Like most monkeys, he has two long arms, two legs, and a long brown tail. Well, here's a bit of the history behind George. Actually, it was Fifi at first, Curious Fifi, the year was 1939, the beginning of World War II, and husband and wife authors Hans and Margaret Ray were living and working in Paris when Hitler invaded Poland. And so they moved to a friend's house in the south of France, continued to write and draw, even as the Third Reich's shadow darkened across Europe. As German citizens of Jewish faith, they felt they were doubly in danger. Their German background made them suspect in southern France, and their Jewish faith meant almost certain death if they were delivered back to the hands of the Germans. Undaunted, they continued their writing and were especially entranced as they originally named him the character, a curious little monkey who was always up to mischief. Their whimsical, brightly colored, optimistic creations contrasted starkly with the darkness of war closing in around them. And then their worst fear happened when a suspicious resident reported them to the local authorities. Who was this strange German couple holed up in a chateau working feverishly on something mysteriously? 
And so when the police arrived to interrogate them, Margaret and Hans Ray showed them drawings and storyboards of curious Fifi. Satisfied that the creators of such sweet cartoons were innocent, the authorities left them in peace. But they soon decided to return to Paris for work. The situation in Paris then again looked grim as Hitler's troops began to close in and millions of people flocked to trains heading to the south of the country or out of the country. But they were unable to get a train ticket, didn't own a car, didn't own a bike. But what they did do was Hans Ray did something that sounds like a plot point in one of his Curious George books. He crafted two bicycles using spare parts. And before they fled, Margaret rounded up all their unpublished children's book manuscripts and illustrations, including Fifi, The Adventures of a Monkey. And they biked out of the city just days before the Germans occupied Paris. And whenever they were stopped at checkpoints during their escape from Paris, the couple showed checkpoint guards their manuscripts and illustrations to prove that they were simply authors and illustrators and were not dangerous. And those narrow escapes became embedded in the themes of their later books. The couple eventually made their way to Brazil and on to New York. Fifi became George. And in 1941, Houghton Mifflin published the first Curious George book, which has now sold over 75 million copies. And it's translated into 19 languages, a PBS program for kids. And the story of the couple's daring escape was told in a documentary film called Monkey Business, the story of Curious George's creators. Oh, by the way, the Mandela effect has to do with this because Curious George doesn't have a tail. He never did. It's said that the Rays chose to depict him without a tail to make him more appealing and relatable to kids so that they can imagine themselves doing the same things as Curious George. The next effect, we've all heard about it, it's the placebo effect. It's an interesting but somewhat difficult to understand phenomenon. How can something like a sugar pill actually relieve a person's pain or hasten their recovery just because of the expectation that it will? Derived from Latin, placebo means I shall please. And when you think about it, that makes sense. It's a very real and powerful effect. Research studies have long used placebos to better understand the true impact of an active drug, for example. Comparing what happens to a group of patients taking an active drug with the results of those taking a placebo can help researchers understand just how good the active drug is. And in study after study, people who take a placebo often show improvement in their symptoms or condition. Research on the placebo effect consistently confirms how powerful it can be and that the benefits of a placebo treatment aren't just all in your head. Measurable physiological changes can be observed in people taking a placebo, similar times to the changes that are observed in people taking an effective medication. Not everyone has a therapeutic response to a placebo because if that were the case, we wouldn't need medications at all. Our healthcare providers would rely instead simply on the power of suggestion. And have you ever heard of the nocebo effect? It's placebo's evil twin, if you will. If you expect a treatment to help you, it may be more likely to do so. That's the placebo effect. But studies have also found that if you expect a treatment will be harmful in some way, you're more likely to experience negative effects. Nocebo, from the Latin, I shall harm. It describes a reduction in the effects of a treatment or a worsening of symptoms or even the new onset of some side effects. For example, tell a person that a headache is a common side effect of a particular medication and the nocebo effect suggests that they're more likely to report headaches, even if they're only taking a sugar pill. Here's another effect. This one's called the bystander effect. It's sometimes referred to as bystander effect. Apathy. It refers to a phenomenon in which the greater number of people there are present, the less likely people are to help a person in distress. Let's say you've witnessed an emergency happening right before your eyes. You'd like to think you would do something to help the person in trouble and not stand idly by, right? Although most of us would like to believe that's the case, psychologists suggest that more often than not, 
whether you really do intervene depends on the number of other witnesses present. When an emergency occurs, observers are more likely to take action if there are few or no other witnesses. Being part of a large crowd seems to result in no one person taking responsibility. The more witnesses, the more we feel that someone else will take care of it, or that there's got to be a reason why no one is helping. In one well-publicized experiment, study subjects were asked to sit in a room and complete written questionnaires. Here's the questionnaire, go in the room. In one setting, the subject was alone when that room began to smell of smoke and the smoke became visible. Setting number two, the subject was present in the room but with two other unknowing people when smoke began apparent. In a third setting, one study subject, along with two researchers pretending to be unknowing people, and those two researchers made a point of being seen as noticing the smoke and the smell, but ignoring it, even as the smoke began to fill the room. And the results? Well, the study subject who was alone in the room as it filled with smoke, 75% of them, not 100, calmly left the room to report the occurrence. And when the subject was present with two unknowing people, only 38% of the subjects left the room to report the smoke. And amazingly and disturbingly, only 10% of the study subjects who were in the room with the two other people who were aware of the experiment, who purposely noticed and ignored the smoke, only 10% left the room to report the occurrence. Those who didn't report it concluded that the smoke must not have been dangerous, or maybe it was part of the experiment. No one attributed their inactivity to the presence of others in the room, though. That study and others have shown that togetherness reduces fear, even when the danger itself isn't reduced. It may have been that people in groups were less afraid and thus less likely to act, or they took their clues from other people in the room, even though they were complete strangers, Maybe they had no common sense, or maybe they felt inhibited to show their fear in a group situations. It also seems that the presence of others leads to something called a diffusion of responsibility. Because there are other observers, we may not feel as much pressure to take action. The responsibility to act is thought to be shared among others. Here's one. Let's say you learn a new word. Suddenly you hear and see it everywhere even though you'd swear you never heard it before. Or someone mentions a product you never heard of before, and then all of a sudden you see it everywhere. The bader meinhof effect refers to a phenomenon in which the frequency of something seems to increase immediately after you learn about it. It's actually sometimes called the frequency illusion effect. It seems that we're constantly taking in so much information every day of our lives that we can't possibly be aware of everything we see and hear at every given moment of time. And so the bider monoff or frequency illusion effect suggests that when we're made aware of something, it causes us to pay attention to it, even if just momentarily. And that information can help us receive other information as we go through our day. Here's an interesting one. It's called the pratfall effect. This effect suggests that your likability will increase if you're not perfect. So don't worry about tripping and falling in front of those around you. Doing so will only make them like you more. And go ahead, admit your failures within limits. It will endear you to others. That's the pratfall effect. It tells us that those who act as if they never make mistakes are thought of by others as less likable than those who commit the occasional trip up or pratfall. Perfection, it seems, creates distance and an unattractive air of invincibility. Those of us with flaws win out every time. It was first studied in 1966 by a social psychologist, Elliot Aronson. He theorized that people who were considered superior could become even more attractive in the eyes of their peers if they made a mistake. He believed that we view our idols as exceptional or superhuman, but a small error can humanize them, making them more likable and relatable. And in his most well-known experiment, he asked participants to listen 
to recordings of people who are answering a quiz. Select recordings included the sound of the person knocking over a cup of coffee, for example. And when participants were asked to rate the quizzers on their likability, it's those where you could hear the coffee cup being knocked over that came out on top because they were the most relatable. And some advertisers have taken the pratfall effect to new heights when marketing their products. One of the most often cited cases of successful use of the pratfall effect is the VW Beetle campaigns of the 1950s and 60s. At the time, the car was everything that the American consumer did not want. It was small, homely, and German at a time when American-made cars were growing larger every year and adorned with more and more chrome and fins. The Beetle became a massive hit, and it's often said to be due to a brilliant advertising campaign. The messages from VW reinforced everything that the typical American consumer didn't like about the Beetle, and it worked. For example, one of the ads read, one of the nice things about owning it is selling it. And another, if you run out of gas, it's easy to push. And even nobody's perfect. But in 2018, Kentucky Fried Chicken faced a chicken shortage in the United Kingdom that forced many of its restaurants to close temporarily. It was clear that drastic marketing action had to be taken. KFC attributed the chicken shortage to delivery issues and it forced the company to close more than half of its 900 British restaurants. Instead of hiding or denying the problem, the company decided to face the problem head on, and they did so by employing the pratfall effect. The goal was to make KFC more relatable, likable, more authentic, recognizing that consumers like to buy from businesses and people they can relate to and that they like. So KFC ran a full-page ad in newspapers with an unequivocal apology. We're sorry, it began, and the company promised to fix the issue. It was considered to be nothing short of brilliant. It was honest and humble, and KFC admitted its flaws and took responsibility for it. It was creative and humorous, using clever wordplay and a funny image to make its flaw stand out and make its audience smile. It was memorable and it went viral. The bottom line, although KFC's customers already loved its chicken and were loyal to its brand, the advertising campaign allowed the company's customers to overlook the temporary problem and appreciate and embrace the company's flaws. What had the most impact was how the company employed the pratfall effect by displaying an image of an empty chicken bucket not with the usual KFC letters prominently displayed, but with the letters FCK. Notice I didn't swear or say anything inappropriate here. And with one more humorous comment, the ad closed with the banner line, the chicken crossed the road, just not to our restaurants. Which leads us to something called the boomerang effect. The boomerang effect, it's sometimes referred to as psychological reactants. The theory suggests that a threat to or a loss of the freedom to make a choice motivates us to try to restore that freedom of choice by counteracting the threat. For example, if a communication is worded too strongly, as in the form of a directive, you must do this, and the freedom not to comply is important to the recipient, then the boomerang effect or the reactance motivation causes the recipient to respond in equally a forceful non-compliance. You can ask, but don't tell me what to do. Or who are you to tell me what to do? For some people, when they see a sign on someone's yard that says, keep off, it compels them to step on the lawn. The boomerang effect tells us that they'd be more likely to stay off the lawn if the sign says, please. It's the difference between a request and a directive. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed it. And I look forward to you joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And in closing, I'd like to leave you with the words of the author F. Scott Fitzgerald. Genius is the ability to put into effect what is on your mind. <laughs>